Uh, Revelation chapter 18, please. Also want to thank the Jarvis ladies for that uh, song. That was a blessing. Thank you, ladies. We won't read the whole chapter. Just ask Pastor. Uh, he won't get through all this today. So let's uh, let's. Uh, oh, I'm being serious when I didn't say that. But I mean, you know, that's a given. <laughs> there was no intent to make fun of Pastor on that one. Obviously, the rest of them were making fun of you, Pastor, but not I. I stood with you. <laughs> All right, let's just go to uh, maybe the first uh, 11 or 12. Now we'll get serious. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her like a measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They shall stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys her cargo anymore. We know God will indeed add a blessing to the reading of his inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Well, thank you, Ron, for your total lack of confidence in me being able to get through this passage. Revelation chapter 18, we've been going through the book of Revelation, and uh, another passage where if you read on through the rest of the chapter, and I do hope we'll cover it all this morning, uh, speaking of God's judgment coming again, and uh, so that's what we'll be covering, Lord willing. Just uh, want to say thank you to those of you who have prayed for me, and my knee's coming along much better, and uh, some told me they were going to be taking bets this morning on whether I could stand here long enough, but if I have to, I'll use a stool. You know, I'll play Andy Stanley for the morning and, and just sort of sit down if I have to, but uh, looking forward to sharing from God's Word here this morning. Missed last Sunday. I was just thinking, sitting down there. Uh, sitting over there at the house last Sunday, and I, I can honestly say I miss being here. And I say that because I want you to understand, I'm not just the pastor of this church. I'm a part of this church. This is my church. I miss you when I'm not able to be here with you. And I love you. I, I thank you for your prayers, for cards, even got a fruit basket that I'm still eating my way through. And uh, God's been good. And I just thank him. As far as I know, the surgery went well. Fixed the meniscus, scraped some stuff out in there that shouldn't be there. And so my knees should be good enough. Hopefully soon I'll be able to get back playing hockey again. And be able to stand here and preach for an hour. Right? Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father... We thank you that we are privileged to be in this place. We have the opportunity to open up this book. We call it the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is truth without any mixture of error whatsoever. 
And I pray, Father, as I preach this morning, I wouldn't add error to it, that you would put your hand upon me in such a way, Lord, that you'd enable me to preach truth and only truth, that, Lord, you'd speak and bring conviction to hearts, that, Lord, you'd help us in our hearts and minds to meet together with you in the Word of God, and that it would have its way in us, Lord, that this truth might rebuke where it's necessary, would encourage where it's needed, would lift us up where we may have fallen. Lord, would give us direction where we lack it. But Lord, help us to find your truth for our lives as we come together in this place. Father, I've already yielded myself to you as best I know how. And I'm here trusting you to work in our midst. Father, we got people not able to be here today because of sickness and other things. We pray for them. Think of those like Betty Hartwright and others, Lord, that are battling cancer, that they might know the comfort and the power and the strength of your presence. Lord, today, touch them and raise them up. And Father, we pray that you give wisdom to their doctors to care and watch over them. Thank you that we live in a day where we have the knowledge and skills that we do available to us. Thank you for this country in which we live. Lord, we pray for our prime minister. Difficult days to give leadership, give him wisdom and insight. Guide his heart, we pray. Father, we live in a land that's turning its back on you. Lord, that our courts are endorsing things like abortion, and euthanasia, and assisted suicide. Lord, it grieves our heart. I know it grieves yours. But Father, we pray that you'd send such a mighty revival to your church. Lord, oh, that you would begin it right here at Devon Park that it would sweep across this land and reverse the godless decisions that are being made and turn hearts back to the Lord Jesus, to the living God. Father, be with us now as we turn our attention to your truth. In Christ's name, amen. I remember years ago living out in Cross Creek, and every so often, they didn't come pick our garbage up. That was a long time ago. You had to take your garbage to the local dump. And I, I remember going down to the dump, and there's a big ditch, and you just threw everything in there. And, and I don't know what, one day I just, I just took special note what was there as I looked into that garbage dump. And you saw the usual things like, you know, leftover scraps from food and that type of stuff, but there were bicycles and there were old television sets. And, and I don't remember everything that was there, but you can kind of guess, right, the, the kind of stuff that you would find there. And, and it, it sunk into my heart, as I hope it will yours, that everything you bought this last week, everything you got at Christmas, Someday is going to be there. Isn't that encouraging? Everything that you worked so hard for all week long and blood, sweat, and tears is going to the garbage heap. Revelation chapter 18 is God bringing to an end the kingdom of Babylon. Chapter 17 that we saw a couple of weeks ago, first of all, introduced us to that beginning of that fall. We've seen it really beginning in chapter 6 through 18 into 19, describes that terrible tribulation period. We've looked at all the judgments that have fallen, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments being poured out. And, and now we're seeing just some little more uh, details that God wants to give us about the fall of Babylon. In chapter 17, we saw the fall of religious Babylon, that part of that empire was it was a very religious empire. And I don't know if you remember, but at the end of chapter 17, we saw that the political portion of that empire turned on the religious portion and, and literally did away with religion. Well, not totally, because there was one form of religion that was still there, and that was the religion of worship of Antichrist, where they worshiped him. And then as we move into chapter 18, 
I drew your attention to the garbage heap, and I hope your mind will stay there a little bit this morning, because we're going to see the end of commercial Babylon, the, the riches and the wealth part of that empire that enabled it to have the control over men that it had. And uh, throughout history, there have been kingdoms of men, some of them petty, some of them great in men's eyes, empires built by proud, generally arrogant, God-rejecting rebels that saw their empires as all that was important, and God had very little place in most of their hearts. That empire building began way back in Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel and the building of the kingdom of Nimrod, which was really the kingdom of Babylon that began. And we see that carried out through human history right up to our own day, where God rejecting people are seeking a utopia without God thinking that through science and their own ingenuities and abilities that we can take over control of our own destinies, that God will have no say, we'll do what we want, we'll make our rules, we'll make our laws, whether it's through the courts or the governments. And they're not kingdoms that are devoted to the sovereignty of God. They're kingdoms that are devoted to the sovereignty of men, where they think they are sovereign and in control. (laughs) What they're going to find out, as we read here in Revelation chapter 18, is that God cannot be so easily dismissed. God cannot be so easily displaced and pushed aside. It's kind of interesting, there's there's so many scriptures, I can't share them all with you, but Acts chapter 14, verse 16 says that God permitted all the nations to go their own ways. He permitted it. He allowed them to do that. It says again in Psalm 2 about those nations that reared up against God, it says, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. We don't want God's fetters. We don't want the word of God because it puts barriers to our lives. It doesn't let us go to the places we want to go and do the things we want to do and act the way we want to act. So let's cast their cords from us. And then God gives this little commentary. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. God's not put into a place where, you know, his, he's just gripping the chair in front of him and his knuckles are turning white. When man stands up and says, God, we don't need you. We're going to do our own thing. We're going our own way and sets up their own kingdoms. Man's vaulted empires. It says in Isaiah 40, 15, are but a speck of dust on the scales. Compared to God and all of his power and all of his might and all of his glory, They're just a speck of dust. They are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Isaiah 40, verse 7. The reality is that God, not man, will have the final word in human history. We're not going to write the story. He is. Revelation 18 just gives us another glimpse or picture of that from the beginning of it to the very end of the judgment of God that falls upon men. David, writing in Psalm 9, says, he notes, the Lord has established his throne. Now listen to this, very interesting. He has established his throne for judgment. God set up his throne. I'm going to sit in judgment. It says he will judge the world in what? In righteousness. That's God going to do that. It's going to accomplish that. Job says that those that reject God and blaspheme his holy name, Job declared that the wicked is reserved for the day of calamity. They will be led forth at the day of fury. We've been studying through. We've been learning about those days of calamity and fury that are coming upon the kingdom of Antichrist, the kingdom of Babel. 
when we read about Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, there's discussion about what, what is Babylon. Well, we know from chapter 17, Babylon is a false religious system. But it's even more than that. Babylon is a, a system, right, of, of governing and running things. It's a whole system of things. It's a system of commerce and politics. But it's also evidently a city. Now, there's different theologians. Some say, no, it's not a city. Some say it is. Five times it calls it a city here. I'm going to take it that it's a city. A city that is the hub for commerce for all of the world, out of which Antichrist himself operates his kingdom. And the amazing thing of it is, without the, with the outpouring of all these judgments and disasters that are taking place, the Antichrist must be a fairly incredible individual that he can build this vast empire and a wealthy, luxurious empire in the midst of those kind of days. It is easy to see how that people will be deceived to follow him because he'll have what they're looking for. He's going to offer them, I'm going to bring about a utopia. I'm going to bring calm out of the storm. I'm going to look after you. I can make you wealthy. All you need to do is get the mark of the what? The beast. And then all will be well. Jesus told us way back in Matthew 13 and some of those parables that are there, there's seven or eight of them in, in Matthew chapter 13. He, he tells about the parable of the tares. And he writes, just, uh, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's he saying? That those who are God-rejectors are going to face the judgment of God. They will face the fire. He tells another one of the parables there. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that's cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up to the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he just says again and again and again. We get the message. Have you got it yet? Have you got it that this world is going to be judged? And those that are apart from Christ and apart from the living God are going to face the judgment hand of God. Paul told the Athenians when he stood before that godless city that God has fixed a day. Already said it. He's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. What he's saying there, the one that I've raised from the dead, that's who? That's Jesus is going to be the one that's going to carry out judgment against planet earth, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. So those things are going to come and the judgment of God is going to fall upon planet earth. And we get these detailed descriptions here in the word of God about how all of this is going to take place. Now, I'm looking at the clock, and what I want to do this morning is run through and give you a Coles Notes version of this chapter. Just hit the highlights, all right, and then come back and spend some time on one point that I think God wants us to look at this morning. So if you'll hold with me, we'll outline it for you, and uh, then we'll come back and spend some time that, that I think we need to spend time on. Uh, getting what God has for us here this morning. I don't know about you, but I've got enough judgment. <laughs> I'm about ready to move on from judgment here, but, but we want to cover this chapter properly. Chapter 1, or chapter 18, the first, first point that I laid out for this chapter is judgment announced. The judgment of God is announced, chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, where it says, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. We've seen a lot of those having great authority. So this angel has great, great power, great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, remember that part of those judgments being poured out was that there was going to be darkness. And in the midst of that darkness, God is going to send this angel and he's going to illuminate the whole earth with his glory. So this is a glorious angel that's coming to bring light into the midst of the darkness proclaiming, I think, the gospel of Christ, and that's the light that the world needs. 
And it says here in verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice. In other words, you can't miss this. They're not going to be able to hide from this message. There's a loud voice going to proclaim this gospel message. And they're also going to hear this, a message of judgment. For he says, Be Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. It's stated twice to emphasize that it's going to be a complete failure and fall of the kingdom of Babylon. Why? Because it's become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed a fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And all he says there is that I'm sending this angel, great authority, sending light into a world of evil. Nobody's going to be able to ignore this. God's going to get the attention of all. And he's bringing judgment, and it's falling. Why? Well, because this city, this system of Babylon is so demonic and so satanic, and it's the, the place where all the demons of the earth, and there's been a lot. We've seen them unleashed in the book of Revelation. 200 million that were formerly bound have been let loose on the sixth trumpet, along with demons released from the abyss at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. And on and on we saw them being unleashed. It's going to be a world that's really, uh, we, we don't, I don't think are aware of how much demonic activity there is even in our country. But this will be a day when demonic activity will go off the scale, off the charts, if you will, because God, so to speak, is going to gather all the rotten eggs <laughs> into one basket and bring them to this place for judgment. They're unclean and hateful, some of the descriptions that are given of them, and uh, uh, just the uncleanness that they bring to the earth. The, they tell us it's a demonic city, it's a depraved city. They drunk of the wine, of the passions of her immorality, and just passionately pursued every ego, evil desire that's on their hearts, unrestricted. I believe that the presence of the Spirit of God has been withdrawn that's been holding it all back, and suddenly there's this flood tide of iniquity that just washes over humanity and the immorality, uh, physical immorality, sexual immorality, spiritual immorality will abound in these days, and they'll follow after every passion. And the merchants of the earth are highlighted here, the ones that deal with commerce and, and money, if you will, uh, they are going to be involved with this satanic system of antichrist and promote the sensuality, and part of it will be to make riches from it. And uh, we'll see that brought out as you go through this particular chapter. So any semblance of self-control and restraint when it comes to sin and iniquity is cast aside. Can you imagine what kind of a world that will be? It almost seems like it today, and we know that yet it hasn't happened. Because the church is still here, the Spirit of God is still restraining and holding back. Imagine when that's lifted and mankind and all of his wickedness goes forth to sin his sin. The second thing I want you to note here is not only uh, the judgment that's announced because of this materialistic and worldly and godless orgy that the world enters into, but he says there's a judgment that can be avoided. Look at it in verse 4 here. Verses 4 and 5 really cover it. This is the one we're going to come back to. He says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven. Now, I want you to think about that little phrase, her sins have reached to heaven. When the original Tower of Babel was being built, the beginning of this false kingdom, they desired to build a tower that would what? Reach to heaven, and God put a stop to it. But for some reason, he's going to allow them to build a tower of sin that does reach to heaven. But when it reaches to heaven, notice what happens. Her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. God what? He remembered. He doesn't forget iniquity. The only way he forgets iniquity when it's put under the blood of Jesus Christ. But we've already seen here, these are people that absolutely refuse to repent, will not change their hearts, will not change their minds, Pursue, in, or pursue iniquity, chase after it, and God says, I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember, 
and I'm going to come and bring judgment because of her sins. Then number three, we see in verses six through eight, judgment is defined here, how it's going to be poured out. And, and we read, beginning in verse six, <coughs> excuse me, it says here, render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. Now, the word double there is a word from which we get the word duplicate. So what he says is, give her in duplicate what she has done. Babylon hasn't just sinned, she's doubled her sin, so God says, we're going to pour out double in judgment upon her. And it's not that she's going to get more than she deserves, but she's going to get what she deserves. Duplicate is to produce something that's, I got this copy and now I produce a copy that's what? Just like it. So in accordance to her sin, she's going to be repaid in equal to the sin that she commits. God says, we're going to pour out judgment. And, and why is this judgment going to come? Well, we read here that she's glorified herself and lived luxuriously. Do you know that God says this, I will not share my glory with another. And one of the great reasons that God's going to judge this system is because Antichrist has risen up and he's been worshipped as God He's forced people to follow him and worship him and take the glory that belongs to who alone? To Christ alone. But I just want to say quickly here that you and I need to be very careful that we aren't seeking glory from men either because all glory belongs to who? Belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. Not, not to me as your pastor, not to Micah as your youth pastor, not, not to the Pope, not to anybody else. All glory belongs to God and God alone. And he's the one that we, and God says, listen, for your sins, <laughs> what you have sinned, you will be paid back for that sin. Because you lived sensuously, you lived immorally, you lived unrighteously in your heart. Because she lifted herself up in her self-sufficiency, she says here, that I, I sit as queen. You know, I'm queen of heaven. I, I'm not going to be a widow. I won't, more, I won't ever see mourning. Why? Because I'm in charge. I'm in control here. What, what she's really saying is, I'm God. And it kind of reminded me of what Satan did as a serpent in the garden when he came to Eve and says, listen, Eve, if you'll do this, you'll be as what? You'll be as God. This creature raises up and says, yeah. And the people that follow him will have that same attitude, that same sinful, wicked attitude. I'm God. I'm the master of my own fate. I'm in charge. I'm in control. I wonder how many of you think I'm in control of my life. You might be like the rich farmer of Luke chapter 12 that thought he was in control. Eat, drink, and be merry. Why? Because you've got much good stored up for the future. I'm in control of the future. And all of a sudden, in one night, snap, it's gone. You're sitting here this morning with some feeling in your heart, I'm God, I'm in charge of my own life. God's got a message for you. You're not, and your kingdom's coming down. There's going to be a crash that's going to take place. We uh, had a sheet of paper with me. I must have set it aside and lost it. You'll be glad. The message will be shorter. I was, I was doing some uh, reading about finances and where they think the trends are going today. And, and a lot of the experts that are out there writing books about it right now are saying there's a crash coming that's going to make the crash of 1929 look like a pimple. That... One, one book I was reading about it says it's going to be a 25-year crash. That things are, are going to, and they've got all these reasons. And I won't, I'm not trying to scare you this morning, but they're saying it's coming. We're set up for it. They're talking about how the, the dollar is under attack. Uh, Kosnitsyn, who's the head of one of the largest banks in Russia, is set, has come out with a statement recently. The dollar's evil and it's coming down. We're going to bring it down. And what, what Russia and China began just about a year ago, December of 2013, to sell off all of 
the euro dollars and U.S. dollars and, and oil dollars, if you will, and, and selling them off. And what they've been doing is building up huge reserves of gold. And the whole purpose of that is to try and bring down the United States as an empire. They want to destroy the dollar. And, and he just goes through and sets a whole lot of things how this could happen. I began to think, you know, if this happens, but in Revelation chapter, chapter 18, there's no if. The whole commercial empire is going to come to one horrible, terrible crash in that day. Now, in the outline that the guys are putting up, you're going to see references there to Isaiah chapter, or Jeremiah rather, chapter 50 and so on. I'm not going to read those for you because I want to get through this and, and get on to something else that I, I want to really spend some time with you this morning. But God says he's going to repay the evil and the wickedness for their self-sufficiency and their sensuality and their self-glorification of what they do. And then uh, point number four of the outline here is judgment lamented. In verses 9 down through verse 19, he, he pours out a lament. And if you read through those verses, the first lament is the kings of the earth are going to see this Babylon that's fallen, fallen, and the smoke is rising up out of this Babylonian city, and the whole kingdom is commerce, and everything comes crashing down. And we'll read about the results of it here. But the kings of the earth, the, the monarchs, if you will, they are going to weep and mourn because they see the loss of everything that, that they have worked for and thought that they had such control. And then you're going to read, it's going to say the merchants of the earth. So it's not just the monarchs, but the, the merchants are, are going to weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Their gold and silver and precious things. Nobody's got any money for it. Nobody's got anything to be able to purchase with. It's all come crashing down. The economy has totally, absolutely collapsed. As a matter of fact, let's just read here for a moment. Verse 11, if you will. It says, The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise, and just notice here, where it starts and where it ends. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of the most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, frank, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, uh, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and bodies and souls of men. I just thought it was very instructive that he begins with gold and he ends with what? With men. And this is a kingdom that's built upon gold and all the other things that people value and part of the luxurious lives that they were living in this day in the city of Babylon was part of and all of that. And it talks about bodies there, can be translated slaves, and then the souls of men, trafficking in the souls of men. Do we have any problem with trafficking with men today? Even our own country is looking to legalize prostitution. There's the sex trade and trafficking in, in souls and and in, in Africa, Boko Haram and those groups and so on are going in and, and taking women out of whole villages and putting them into bondage and slavery. Gold to men. What's at the top? Gold. What's at the bottom? We live in a world where the lives of men really don't have a whole lot of value anymore, do they? We've devalued it through the teaching of evolution and everything else in our society. And the, the thing that men are lusting after and longing for is gold and riches and all that it buys and all that it provides. And God's, and by the way, there's about 28 different items listed there. And God says it's all going to go. Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen. The economy will collapse, will fall apart, all of it will, will be destroyed. And we just read here the catalog of the, the opulence and the luxuriousness and the vanity of it all. Look at verse 14. It says here, the fruit that your soul longed for has what? Everything you longed for, desired, 
has gone from you. It's all going to be taken away. If that's what you live for, if that's what your life is about, it's fleeting. It's going to run away on you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more. How many of you love the no mores of Scripture? When we read about heaven, we love the no mores. No more sin, no more, no more, no more, right? I want you to know that on the other side, there's some no mores as well. He says here, there will be no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. From one hour, such great riches come to, what is it? Nothing at all. And they cried out when they saw her smoke rising. Just jump down to verse 20 for a moment. We see judgment and joy. I'm not going to spend time on this, but it says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Those that were under the altar, I think it was in chapter 6 that were crying out, how long, how long, it's going to be answered. God says, now, the judgment of God falls upon this evil, vile, wicked kingdom that's come. In verses 21 through 23a, uh, he talks about the judgment that's completed. A strong angel is going to step up, and he gives a picture here of taking a millstone and casting it into the sea, and it's obviously going to what? Sink to the bottom. So that's the kingdom of Antichrist, Babylon will be cast down, never to rise again. And, and he goes on and talks about the no mores of this kingdom here. Uh, beginning in verse 21, so Then the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. No more Babylon. So that's the first no more. The sound of harpists, musics, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be... The leisure goes, the enjoyable things of life are gone. No more, he says, shall be heard in you. No more. No craftsman, no more craftsman. Any craft shall be found in you anymore. The, 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 he talks about millstones, no, no uh, uh, manufacturing. None of this will be going on. It's brought to a standstill. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. No more light. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. No more of the natural relationships that we have of getting married and having families. It's coming to a no more because of this. Why, God? And he says, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain upon the earth. And what we see there is the judgment of God justified and why God had to bring it all to an end. Now, having said that, give me a few minutes, if you will, to just bring you back to the, the second thing that we talked about there, where he said that this judgment can be avoided. That's the good news, right? And as I read through this chapter, and probably as you've been sitting here this morning, say, I, I am so tired of hearing about the judgment of God, the judgment of God, the judgment of God. I think I get it. God's going to judge. But I sat back as I looked at this chapter and really prayed and asked God, what do you, what do you want us to get out of this? The, the question came to me that should have come to me a long time before, because every time you read a portion of Scripture, you ought to be asking yourself, what did it mean to the people when? Back when it was written. When the people first got this letter, and it was the, the people, it was written to who? The The seven churches of Asia. They would have gotten this. It would have been read. And what we want to know is, why? Were, what was God's intent in giving them this 18th chapter of Revelation? What did he want to come home to them? And one verse just leaped out of that. Not because I'm smart, it's, it just leaps out of it. The message is to that church back then and to the church this morning, come out of her, my people right? Is there a Babylon that's out there today, a system that's anti-God of unrighteousness and worldliness that wants to reject God and walk away from Him? And what does he say to the people of God at Devon Park Baptist on this Sunday morning, February the 8th, 
If God were here, what would he scream? Come out of her. Please come out of her. Don't try to be a part of it. Come out of it. Don't try to be like it. Don't try to copy it. Dare I say this? For God's sake, come out of her. Come out of her, my people. If you're mine, if you're genuine, if you're real, if you've been saved, come out of her. It may even be an evangelistic call that if you still have any understanding of God at all, come out of her, come to God. Put your trust in God, not in your riches, not in the commerce, not in the system of Antichrist. Put your trust in the Lord. Come out of her, my people. It's not the first time God's called people to come out, by the way. You remember there was two cities named Sodom and Gomorrah, and a man of God wasn't living like it, but he was living there, named Lot. And Lot is, gets a messenger from God. Angels come to him, and what do they say? Come out of her. I'm going to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Come out of her. Get away from there. Hurry. Take your wife and your daughters and your family and get away from there because God's going to bring judgment. And he says this, when you go out, don't even look back. And you know the story is they're getting away from there. The angels are dragging them, had to take Lot by the hand and his wife by the hand, and he's dragging them out. That Lot's wife looks back. I'm assuming because there was some longing in her heart that says, I don't want to go there, I'd rather stay there. And do you remember the story? She was what? Turned into a pillar of salt, just like that. We could spend some time on that. I won't. But he's saying, don't look back. Come out of her. I want to say to you this morning, the message of God is come out and don't look back. Come out as a Christian. Take your stand. Walk with God. Get your focus on Christ, not on the world, not on riches, but on Jesus. He's the only thing that's of value for you to focus yourself upon. By the way, Jesus, in Luke chapter 17, makes a commentary about what happened there uh, with Lot. And I, again, sadly can't go and, and read that whole passage, but, but he says this, Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, until what? Until the day that fire rained down upon. He says, Christians, don't let that be the quality of your life. Don't just be planning and building for this life and this world. Be living for God in this world because one day everything that you're trying to build up and bigger houses and cars, and bank accounts is all going to collapse. All going to fall down. Interestingly, Jesus says, remember. Lot's wife. Christian this morning, remember Lot's wife. Don't be looking back at what the world has to offer. Run. Run. Run to God. Run to Jesus. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The Scriptures exhort us. Again, the story of Korah and Nathan and Abiram, who had raised up in rebellion against uh, uh, Moses and his leadership. And, and there's a point there where it's, he says to the people, come out of them. <laughs> come out and, and separate yourselves from them. Why? Because I'm going to open up the earth and swallow them. I'm going to bring judgment upon them. Come out of them. And then there's that passage in the New Testament. It's not all just Old Testament. The New Testament says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, what communion has light with darkness, what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever. That's not saying you can't have a friendship with an unsaved person. You're not going to win them if you don't have a friendship, but you can't partake in their sins. He makes that clear in what he says in Revelation chapter 18. Come out of her, my people, that you not be what? Not be caught up in her sins, not be a part of the sin that she's committing. Chapter 6 of, of 2 Corinthians verse twelve or uh, 17 says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Come out from among them. Be separate. 
I read something, a church looking for a pastor sent me a while back, not, not all that long ago. And it says, we're looking for somebody that's a good mixer. And I thought, well, that's probably not me. I'm not that good a mixer. I'm a little on the shy side. But I thought when I read this pastor, you know, our churches don't need good mixers. We need good separators. We need how to separate the clean from the unclean. We know how to we, we need preachers that know how to make a difference between iniquity and righteousness and are prepared to draw a line and stand for God and stand for His Word in this day and are ready to call God's people come out from among the things of this world and this system. Don't live for what it has to offer and the riches that it, it offers to you, but come out from among them. It's like you're at school and you, you coming down the hallway and you go come around the corner and there's a group of your friends there, and they got some spray paint, and they're spray painting mustaches on a big picture of the principal. When all of a sudden you hear coming down the hall, and I don't know why they do it, but every principal does it, don't they? They got these shoes, click, 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 and you know they're coming. And, and when you know he's coming, and here's your friends with the spray paint, all of a sudden you adopt the attitude of a fundamentalist believer. Get out of there. Separate. Get out of that place. Why? Because you don't want to be caught there. That's what God is saying. Come out of her. You don't want to be caught there because if you're caught there, it means you've, you've chosen there. You've chosen not for God. You've chosen for this world and what it has to offer to you. He says, come out of her. Come out of Babylon. Flee Babylon. The question came to mind, how do you flee Babylon? And a marvelous idea came to my mind. Let's all pool our money. Let's go down to the Caribbean and buy a Christian island for ourselves, and we'll all live together there. I mean, with the temperature outside, that sounds good, doesn't it? But that's not what he's telling us to do here when he says, come out. He's not saying go off in a little monastery, practice asceticism and all of that. He says, come out of her. How do you do that? By no longer doing what? Sharing in her sins. That's the way you come out. You don't share in her sins. You, you don't watch the filth that they watch. I don't even want to use the name of it, but there's a, a, a certain film that's coming out called Fifty Shades of Grey or something to that effect, and I've not seen it, and I've not even read the book, and I don't intend to, but I've seen enough uh, advertisements on the Internet and so on that it's absolutely filthy, and I want to tell you there's no child of God that's right with God that will go and watch it. I don't have any problem telling you that. I'm not saying you can't go watch any movie. I'm saying a child of God shouldn't watch that movie. You shouldn't, your heart should not be drawn to want to watch that kind of a movie. We want to follow and pursue after righteousness. Come out from among them and be ye what? Be ye separate. And I'm pretty aware that I'm pretty old-fashioned to be preaching a message on separation today. I don't mind that. You can call me a dinosaur if you want. That's the kind of dinosaur I want to be when we stand for righteousness and we say no to unrighteousness. There, there are two sins particularly that they need to come from. And I, and I know I've got to wrap this up. One of those sins is prosperity. The sin, and, and prosperity in itself isn't wrong. It's not wrong to have money. Abraham was rich and several other people in the Bible, Barnabas and so on, were very wealthy people. But it's an aspect of worldliness, of seeking prosperity at any cost, of letting go of every value that you may have once held to in order to become prosperous. You'll steal and cheat and get involved in gambling and drugs or anything else. By the way, we're going to see that in that kingdom and of, of Antichrist. He talks about there in, at the end of chapter 18 about sorcery. The word sorcery is pharmakia, from which we get pharmaceuticals, which is drugs. And a big part of his kingdom and control over people, I believe, will be from the drug industry that they'll be making millions and billions of dollars upon at that time for the kingdom of Antichrist. What's he say? Come out of her. The idea of, of prosperity is that we begin to put our trust in the prosperity instead of putting our trust in God. We begin to make compromises. It says the kings of the earth 
partook in the fornications and the adulteries and the whoredoms of this kingdom. And he says, come out from, a, from among her. The sad fact is it's hard to distinguish a lot of times Christians from the non-Christians because the immorality sexually and otherwise is so crept into the church today. And we're not standing for righteousness and we're not standing for purity of heart. What does he say? Come out of her. Come out of her. Be clean. Be pure. Be holy. You ever have a message where you knew it was important and yet you look at the clock? I wonder how much we've gotten caught up as Christians in the pursuit of prosperity and where we dip our sails in order to have prosperity because we want things. We want that Martha Stewart house. We, we want the things to enjoy and live what? Luxuriously. If God came along and dropped a few hundred dollars into your life this week, if he did that to me, I, I sat in my office and thought about that. What, what would be my first thought? I thought, you know what? All of a sudden, there'd be this golf club that I just thought that I have to have. I need it. I don't need it at all. It's a sign of worldliness when my first thought is what I will buy me for, with this. And my first thought isn't, you know what? Maybe I could give that to Slavic Gospel Association and they could help a church planter over in Russia. Or I could send this through Partners International and help some church planter in India, in Calcutta, or in that area, right? If we were thinking as the people of God, wouldn't that be the way we begin to think? We become so caught up in this world system. We've allowed it to squeeze it into its mold. We begin to think like them. And God says the people of God need to think in a different way. We need to come out from among them and be separate. If you're a Christian employer, it's okay to make a profit, but if you're paying your, your employees a pittance and really cheating them for the work they do and they live in poverty so you can live in luxury, the Bible says there's something wrong with that. You bought into the spirit of the world. If you're neglecting the support of your local church, I'm not here to pass the offering plate again, but... It, you're spending money on yourself and say, well, I need this and I need that, and you're not helping to support your local church. You're caught up in the spirit of worldliness, spirit of prosperity. I was going to say some things about gambling and the lottery. I'll, I'll skip on that. I, I, I want to get done. You'd be proud of me if you knew how much I'm leaving out right now. Come out. Come out of her. My people. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. What I want to ask you to do this morning is look down into your life and ask yourself, where has worldliness crept into my life? Where have I dipped my sails? Where have I allowed myself to drift into areas that I know I shouldn't be a part of? Where am I allowing money and other things to influence me? Maybe to cheat on my income tax or do other things so I can have this or that. We've allowed worldliness to creep in. I love what John Wesley said. John Wesley said, the danger for the Christian is that he develops a good work ethic because the Bible teaches you ought to be a good worker. And if he develops a good work ethic, he's probably going to prosper. And then when he prospers, it will take his heart away from God. We live in a prosperous country. We're prosperous people. Where have we let prosperity draw our hearts away from our God? to focus our attention on ourselves so that we seek to live in luxury, well, we know there are those that don't have enough. And we're content with that. It doesn't even bother our hearts any longer. 
book of Revelation presents two masters. One's a beast, the other's the lamb. <laughs> Whose voice are you listening to? Who are you going to follow? There are two cities. There's the Babylon, the kingdom of Antichrist, or there's the New Jerusalem. Which city are you pursuing? Abraham, the Bible says, was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. Are you seeking that city? Is that your goal in life? Which one are you living for? What he says here in this book is leave this master to pursue this master. Leave this city so that one day you can enjoy this city in your heart, in your life. Leave the fleeting and fleeing pleasures of sin and worldliness for the lasting joy of following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 18 says, God remembered. What, does, what did it say he remembered? It says he remembered their sins. What will God remember about your life? Hope it's not your sins. The good news, if you're here and there's sins in your life, you can bring them to Jesus and put them under the blood and you can be what? You can be forgiven. My sheep... Hear my voice. Did you hear his voice this morning? Did some things come to your mind? I hope they did. I pray they did. If I'd had time, I'd have been even more explicit, and I'm pretty sure he would have. But sometimes the Spirit of God needs to do what the preacher can't do, right? Let God search your heart. Let God search your heart. Some of you may need to come and just kneel here at the altar this morning. The praise team is going to come and close very quickly for us. Go ahead and come. But if God spoke into your heart this morning, God's word always requires a response. And I don't care if it's a visible one where you come and you kneel here, but you better let God do some business in your heart. You better make some choices this morning. Which kingdom am I going to live for? What master is going to rule my life? Will it be money? Or will it be the Lord Jesus Christ? Are there some things this morning I need to make some decisions about? I would guess that there are for all of us, me included. Will we hear his voice? Will we follow him? And if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you're still in your sins, the good news, you can come out of those sins by coming to Jesus and finding forgiveness at the cross. Come to Jesus this morning. Let's stand, shall we?